Good morning, people of God. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme today, pushy faith, pushy faith. Brian cannot remember a time when he did not want a dog. As soon as he could point whenever a dog was around, he would point and squeal with delight. When he was finally able to speak, he would say, doggy, doggy. When his vocabulary grew more extensively, he would say, I want a dog. His babysitter had a dog and they grew, they grew up together. While the babysitter was tugging the seat up the steps to her apartment on the second floor, the dog and Brian were climbing the steep stairs together. Brian, by the time he was four, began to ask his dad for a dog. Daddy, I, I want a dog. And the question was always met with a firm no. Brian's dad had not grown up with a dog and the only thing he could concede was that a dog was another responsibility. And honestly, as a single parent, he already felt more than overwhelmed with raising his son. He knew that Brian would get over it. All Brian knew was that he loved dogs and he thought that having his own dog would simply put him over the moon. And so Brian never got tired of asking his dog, not his dog, <laughs> Brian never got tired of asking his dad for a dog. And his dad did not get tired of saying, no. These forces continued to meet until Brian turned 10 years old and his grandfather, his dad's dad, died which you all know that sometime losing a parent can stir up stuff in us. And so for Brian's dad, he began to remember stuff. He began to remember how he had always begged, begged and begged his dad for a set of drums. And his dad had always said, no. And he began to think to himself, have I become my dad? And so it began to toss around in his mind this no that he had been giving every year. The death of his dad gave him the challenge to look at himself a little bit more closely. Brian never stopped asking for a dog, but something was changing in his dad. A shift was happening. Talking about pushy faith, in the Bible passage today, a man goes over to a friend's house at midnight and says, look, I have company. Let me get three loaves of bread. It's midnight. Did I, did I, did I tell you all it's midnight? <laughs> it's midnight. At midnight, the man goes to another person's household and says, I need to get some bread. The other man replies, as you heard Edith read so eloquently, the door is locked, the kids are in bed, and I am not getting up to give you anything. Do you know what time it is? Now you would think that the friend would get a clue. It's midnight and go home, but he doesn't. And it's implied in the text that he continues, he persists. We're talking about pushy faith, pushy people. Have you guys ever noticed that pushy people do not go away? They are not stopped by no's or rejections. They keep on trying to make something happen. Like a rubber ball, they just bounce right on back. They are not easily offended. They are not easily deterred. They do not quit. Pushy people often are able to see their goals so clearly that they're not deterred by yellow or red lights. Pushy people push. They push. Pushy faith is pushy people not giving up. Kevin Hart is a well-known comedian. You might even know him. You might not. But trust me, he's a comedian. He was told no so many times. He had lots of setbacks. He was told over and over again, you're not really that funny. 
After getting a break in the film industry, his shows and his movies, they either flopped at the box office or they got canceled. Kevin had every right to give up. It was becoming clear he wasn't really all that talented. This was not working. Now, Kevin was pushy, but even pushy faith has its low points. Even when we're going 99 for Jesus, sometime we hit some bumps. And Kevin was there. His mom early on in his career said she would financially support him for one year if he needed it. But they had to have this agreement as long as he was reading his Bible. And so it got pretty desperate. And Kevin felt like, oh, I need, I, I, I need this money for my rent. And he went to his mom. And his mom said, Kevin, have you been reading your Bible? And he thought, my mom knows me. No, mom, I haven't been reading the Bible. Come on now, I, I need money for the rent. Mom says, Kevin, read your Bible. That was the agreement. So he goes away, and he, he's behind two months in rent now, and it's pretty bad. And he comes back to his mom. He's like, mom, look. You promised to support me. I need money for the rent. His mom said, have you read your Bible? Well, he thought I'm desperate, so he lied and said, yes, I read my Bible, mom. I need the money for rent. His mom looked at him and said, Kevin, you're lying. You haven't read your Bible. He storms out, he's mad, he leaves. He's like, my mom is really tripping. All I'm asking for is money for rent. She promised to support me, contingent on one thing that I read my Bible. He goes home, he's frustrated. He looks up at his Bible, it's dusty. He hasn't touched it since he got it from high school graduation. He opens his Bible and guess what happens? A check for every month of his rent falls out. Seven checks fall out of the Bible onto the floor. His mom had kept her word. Kevin eventually got back up because that's what pushy faith does. In his mom, he had a wonderful example of pushy faith. And he said it was at that moment it clicked that if I'm going to succeed, I will have to persist. He says there are seven ingredients to succeeding, and the number one ingredient is persistence, pushing, being pushy. Kevin, for seven years, worked up his brand on the road, sometime with 50 people in the audience, doing comic. Seven years it took him to come back, persisting, being pushy. Let's take one more look at the pushy guy in this biblical text today. Three things that you don't notice at first, because you're so assaulted that he would go to anybody's house at midnight to ask for a loaf of bread. One of the things is he is also convenient, inconvenienced. Yeah, check it out. His friend showed up late to his house. Not sure if it was a canceled flight or what, but nevertheless, this person comes to his house late, unexpectedly throwing the host off who has nothing in his space to show hospitality toward the guests. Remember, our actions often impact others, even though we don't know it most of the time, that what we do have implications and impact on others. This man was responding to a situation himself, thereby creating another situation. He didn't want to disturb the man at midnight. He wasn't being selfish. He didn't go out of his way to wake somebody else up but he had company and hospitality was important. Point number two, upon second look, we can see that this man really does believe in hospitality. That this guy shows up on his doorsteps. When folks come to us, no matter the time, the condition or the situation, we can always extend hospitality, kindness, generosity. Haven't you ever gotten that phone call at 5 a.m. or some weird hour? Somebody was desperate looking. This man wanted to make sure that his guest was attended to right now at midnight. 
He wanted to care for him and receive him properly into his home. And point number three, lastly, this guy was asking for bread on behalf of somebody else. He's not asking for bread for himself. It's not all about him. But late at night, he's not up over someone's house saying, hey, I need some bread to fix a ham sandwich. He is absolutely thinking of somebody else. The man is inconvenienced, is still attempting to show hospitality, and last, he's thinking about somebody else's welfare. How many of you have had a flat tire? How many of you have had a flat tire more than once? Do they come at the most convenient time? I mean, right when you had nothing else to do, the flat tire just shows up and you got all the time in the world, the money and everything to deal with it. No, nope, it's like the coldest day in winter and you run over an unfixed pavement in Chicago and bam, flat tire. You can feel your fingertips one minute outside the car. You're trying to get somewhere. You're trying to change the tire, but the nuts won't move. You can't feel your fingers anymore. You jump back in the coal car. You're just trying to figure out how to get the car parked, get a tow truck, and get somewhere warm real fast. Life is inconvenient. Somebody should just say amen. Life is messy, and life is hard. Adulting, now somebody ought to really say amen, adulting is super hard. Our faith, our pushy faith, is to help us navigate the inconvenient, the messy, and the hard. Now that we have established just how hard life is, how will we use our faith? What are you willing to ask God for over and over and over again? Little one, I'm so glad to see and hear you this morning. I'm sure you had to do a lot to get here, sister. It's good to see you. Stacy Edwards Dunn is the executive minister at Trinity United Church of Christ Chicago. She thought she said she was going to be a doctor, and then she felt this call to ministry. As she was taught, she sought to solidify the presence of her career as a minister, and then she pursued marriage. And in 2007, she got married to her beau, to her love, at 37 years old. And they decided, often what people decide when they get married, they wanted to have kids. And that's when she learned, after trying and trying, the doctor told her, diagnosed her as infertile. Stacy began to ask God for a baby. In our country, 7.3 million women struggle with infertility. Stacy joined the ranks. Many women who get the news stop asking because they're unable to get pregnant. It's frustrating, says my friend. It's frustrating the methods you have to go through, the things the doctors do to you to try to get pregnant. But for Stacy, she never stops asking God for a baby. She never, however, stopped asking God for a baby. Year one, no baby. Year two, no baby, still asking God. Year three, no baby, and four, and five, and six. You know this story. After several procedures with the doctor, failed attempt after failed attempt. Didn't work. Along her journey, she begins to feel this need to have others to talk to. She begins to encounter other women who are going through the same thing that she's going through. And she discovers there's no place for us to gather and talk about this journey. So in 2013, she formed Fertility for Color Girls. She believes giving life to this organization was her first baby. She founded it in 2013, and a year later, after painful asking and asking and asking God, Stacy became pregnant with Shiloh. And at 52 years old, this year, Stacy gave birth to a second baby. 
There are now 15 chapters across the United States because Stacy. She said, I didn't realize how much of a need was out there that when I started, women were calling me constantly. You see, Stacy began by asking God on behalf of herself. But today, she's asking God for others. One of her greatest joys, she says, is when a woman calls her up and says, God has answered my prayer. Now this morning, I don't want you all to get God often confused with Santa Claus. They are a little close. I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, pastor told me to go make up that list. Because today we see how selfless the asking is. But I have put a blank sheet in your bulletin. Do you guys see that little blank little sheet? I put a blank sheet in your bulletin now and through the music for you to think about what do you want to ask God for? What do you want to ask God for? You can write it down and put it in the offering plate if you want to share it. You can write it down and keep it to yourself. Or you can just make a mental note and the sheet of paper will remind you that you can ask. Jesus says to the disciples, ask me. Let your faith push you to ask me. Brian got the dog. Kevin got the career. Stacy got the baby. And the neighbor got the bread. You get to read the last chapter, but their asking was met with no's. Their asking was met with folks who didn't understand. Their asking was met with adversity. Their asking was met with rejection. Their asking was met with indifference. Their asking was met with hostility. Their asking was met with words. But guess what? In every instance, the person at the wheel kept on, kept on asking, asking God, ask God, ask God, ask God for what you want. Jesus turns to the disciples and says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Let's have some pushy faith. Amen.